Father in heaven, we thank you for the great hope that we have in your son, Jesus. Thank you that in him and in him alone do we have salvation, safety, deliverance with you, rescue. There's nothing that we could do to deliver ourselves. We only delivered ourselves into sin and wrath. But he delivered us from our sin and from your wrath through his great, amazing death at the cross, through the shedding of his blood in our place. What an amazing God you are, and we pray, Lord, that as we continue in our worship that we would have our eyes set on your word that we might see you and know you and marvel at you and your son, Jesus. Meet with us. We depend upon you to understand what you even write to us. We depend on you to be transformed by what we see in your word. We ask for this help in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's once again take our Bibles and open them up to Romans chapter four. We'll be in verses 13 to 17 this morning. Romans chapter four, verse 13 to 17. And as you're turning there, I'm gonna ask you a question. How different is biblical Christianity from everything else outside it? Biblical Christianity, meaning Christianity that conducts itself strictly according to the Bible. Because you know there there is a brand of Christianity that strictly conducts itself according to trend and not truth. So how different is biblical Christianity from everything else outside of it? How different is biblical Christianity from a cult with Christian features? How different is Christianity, biblical Christianity, from Mormonism, from Catholicism? How different is biblical Christianity from Islam, from Hinduism, from some kind of pagan tribal animism, polytheism? You only need to look one place to see how different biblical Christianity is from everything else. You look at the epicenter of the gospel. Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All of that apart from works. Do you remember these illustrations from last week? To be a Grammy-winning singer. There's only one way to get there. Before you ever receive the Grammy into your hands, before that, one must sing and sing and sing and sing prior to that, and sing really well prior to that. Nobody who receives a Grammy is at that moment somebody who actually, as they receive it, is like, well, I hate singing, and I've never sung a day in my life. Or to receive an A at the end of a semester, there's only one legitimate way to get there, and that is before then, before the day of that grade coming out, to before that get one A after another A after another A after another A, or to at least get more A's than any other grade. Nobody who receives an A at the end of the semester for a class finds out that they weren't even enrolled in the class or that they never got one A prior to it. You see, that's just the way the world works because this is the way that humans work who run the world. And therefore, when a fallen human crafts his own religion and his own concept of God and how to approach his made-up God, he can't help but think in this same vein. Every other approach to God outside of biblical Christianity picks this way, this path, to be received by God, the God that I've made up in my mind, to be found with the status that would be pleasing to him prior to that moment, I must be somebody who's been already pleasing to him. Or to use the gospel's key term of righteousness, every other idea outside of biblical Christianity would say it this way, to be found with the righteousness that God will accept. There's only one way for me to get there, and that is I must practice and practice and practice righteousness as much as I can beforehand. I will be justified by righteous works that I do. But you see, biblical Christianity is concerned for the gospel to have its full and its entire say. 
on what God's way of salvation of sinners is. And it's completely unlike any other approach. It's not just kind of sort of different than Mormonism or Catholicism. It is entirely the opposite. Because the gospel says, if you want to be found with God's very own perfect righteousness, and by the way, that is the only valid form of righteousness God even accepts. If you want to be found with God's very own perfect righteous status, there is only one way to get there by not trying to be righteous first. The only way to get there is by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, without any reliance whatsoever on any good deeds. And upon believing Jesus Christ, God puts into the believer's account his very own righteous status, even though that one believing is currently ungodly. Nobody who receives God's righteous status in justification is already at that moment righteous in their practice, in their character. Say it the other way. Everyone who receives God's very own perfect righteous status in justification receives it by faith while being at that very moment still ungodly, unrighteous in character and practice. We saw this in Romans 4 verse 5. This is the God who justifies the ungodly. It has to be this way. Biblical Christianity, the gospel of Jesus Christ says that God does not justify those who are already reforming, already improving, already progressing, already developing, already recovering, already recuperating, rehabilitating, adapting. God doesn't justify those who are already amending their ways or overhauling their life or making some new adjustments or already trying to hit the reset button. He is the God who justifies the ungodly. And he does it simply, apart from any works, entirely through faith. Believe Jesus Christ and believe him only. You see, where justification is, as the gospel defines it, good works can never be found there. Or where good works are found, justification can never be found. They don't co-mingle. Just like two plus two can never be four and also five, justification can never include both faith and works. They are mutually exclusive to one another, and this is what foundationally, fundamentally separates biblical Christianity from everything else. In fact, it even separates biblical Christianity from trendy, man-centered versions of Christianity. And this is why Jesus Christ alone is the Savior, the one and only Savior of sinful men. Because his gospel is by grace alone, through faith alone, in him alone. So when anyone tries to draw a comparison or point out the similarities between what it means to be a Christian in some other way, some other religious approach to God, the hair on the back of your neck should stand up. It did for Paul. And that's the reason Romans 4 is where it is in the letter to the Romans that he wrote. Paul preached that very gospel from one Jewish synagogue to another across the Roman Empire. He did that not once, he didn't do it twice, he did it three times on three missionary journeys over a period of 10 years. By the time he wrote this, the gospel of justification by faith alone, it bumped hard up against the Jews who loved works righteousness in those synagogues. Think of the protests he heard from those Jews in those synagogues over a 10-year period of time concerning how God justifies the ungodly through faith alone and not through works. Paul's letter to the Romans, as we've talked about, and I'm going to keep saying this over and over, it is two things rolled up and mixed together wonderfully for us. Number one, it is the content of the gospel, justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Christ alone. 
But Romans is also how to preach that gospel, how to respond to objections to it, how to dismantle wrong thinking that butts right up against it. And Romans 4 is Paul's God-breathed strategy for addressing the primary protests the Jews would have had against the gospel of God's grace. In Romans 4, Paul reveals to us that the protests primarily centered on Abraham. The Jews committed to works righteousness. They would have felt that Paul's gospel was an all-out assault, not just on them, and not just on their works righteousness, but Paul's gospel, they would have thought, was an all-out assault on Abraham because of their misunderstandings about him. In Paul's preaching, he continually attached Messiah Jesus with Abraham. And so a Jew would have, hearing this, responded with skepticism, thinking, Jesus who? Imagine a Jew in a synagogue in Thessalonica finding out that Messiah came. You claim our Messiah has come. Well, then why are we still under the bondage of Rome? And his name is Jesus, and he's from Nazareth? Crucified, you say. Right, yeah. And you keep tying to that one all of the promises that God made to us in Abraham? You've got to be kidding. Romans 4, verses 21 to 25 will help us with that at the end. A, a Jew hearing this gospel of God's grace would have said something maybe like this to Paul. Well, our rabbis teach us that Abraham actually performed all of the law in its completeness before it was ever given at Sinai through Moses. That's pretty good. If you can complete the whole law before it's ever given... Therefore, Abraham merited the promises of God and the righteousness from God. He's our hero father. What do you mean no man can boast in salvation? What do you mean by all this setting aside of law and its works for salvation? Our hope as a nation has been in and will be through law and the works associated with it. Paul dealt with that in the first verse eight verses of chapter four and in our passage today that you will see. And a Jew would have even also objected, thinking, Paul, in your gospel preaching, you keep putting down circumcision. It's, it's a privilege. It's important. Our rabbis have taught us that circumcision is what opens the door for salvation. It's like a trigger. It triggers. Now salvation can take place. This is why Gentiles must be circumcised. Our greatest hero, you know, Abraham, he was circumcised and God credited it to him as righteousness, you know, and they misunderstood and they forgot that Genesis 15 was before Genesis 17. And a 14-year gap existed between when he was declared righteous, when Abraham was declared righteous by faith alone, and 14 years later when he was circumcised. The summary kind of protest that a Jew committed to works righteousness would have had to the gospel of God's grace would have been something primarily like this. Paul, if your gospel is the way you say it is, that justification is by faith alone apart from any works, then number one, your gospel is an attack on our father Abraham. And secondly, your gospel is completely out of alignment with the Old Testament. The gospel in Paul's day and being a Jew as they understood being a Jew and redefined being a Jew were completely at odds with one another. Biblical Christianity was fundamentally, is fundamentally incompatible with works, righteousness, Judaism too. And so Romans 4 shows us how Paul dealt with these kinds of challenges while he preached the gospel. And what is so wonderful in reading this important chapter is to see how the gospel of God's grace fully relies on the Old Testament to defend itself. Where does the gospel turn to defend salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Messiah alone? The Old Testament. That's what Romans 4 is all about. Romans 4 is the gospel's use of the Old Testament to defend justification by faith alone apart from any works. 
And the gospel's argument from the Old Testament primarily then deals with Abraham. That's why this chapter deals with Abraham. And the Jews committed to works righteousness are in for a surprise because they're going to find out that Abraham is not opposed to the gospel of God's grace. So what is this passage all about? Put it up for you. Four declarations from the Old Testament on justification prove that faith has always been God's unchanging way of saving unrighteous sinners. Four declarations. We covered these first two last week. The Old Testament declares, number one, justification was never through works. And secondly, the Old Testament declares that justification was never through circumcision. You can listen to last week's message and get caught up on that. Now let me read our verses, the next ones, verses 13 to 17. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is also no violation. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations, I have made you in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So let's take the third declaration this morning. Number three, the Old Testament declares Justification was never through law. Now, I want you to notice with me first this morning the connection. The gospel here in verse 13 and all the way through verse 17 makes a connection between justification by faith alone and the promise that God made to Abraham. He connects them. Just what exactly Paul and the gospel are trying to do here in this paragraph can be puzzling. There's no doubt that the gospel is appealing to the Old Testament to make it clear to us that justification was never by law, and Abraham is that central figure in that argument. The Old Testament and the gospel are in perfect tandem, and they will make this clear through the person Abraham. But what's confusing potentially is how the gospel is making this argument from the Old Testament, that justification was never through law concerning Abraham, because he talks about the promise so much. Verse 13, the promise to Abraham or to his descendants was this, that he would be heir of the world. The promise to be an heir of the world, that takes prominence in this whole argument. You might expect Paul to just leave out any mention of that promise or him being the father of nations or whatever to make the singular case that Abraham was justified just simply by not adding any law to himself, to his life. That would be sufficient, it would seem, but that's the argument he basically already made in verses 1 to 8. So why all of this focus on the promise? Why all this focus on being an heir, being descendants? Let's see if we can't, by the time we're done with this passage, answer that question. Why justification is paired inseparably with God's promise to Abraham? So notice with me first, just the plain fact of the connection. Number one, the connection. And the sentence that you see up there in parentheses is my attempt to offer you just a one-sentence summary of what that section is. So... Faith's righteousness is inseparably connected to God's promise to Abraham. Paul mentions that the promise that he referred to back up in verses 11 and 12, and the descendants or the offspring of Abraham are a part of that promise. He says in verse 13 that for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants, you see, they're connected with it. Well, what is the promise? Verse 13, that he would be heir of the world. That's a big promise. The world is in view. 
and one man is heir to it with all of his descendants. And again, his descendants are mentioned back up in verses 11 and 12. They are spiritual offspring of him because being an offspring or a descendant of Abraham is by faith or by believing God. And it doesn't matter if the believing one is a Jew in verse 11, uh, one who is circumcised, or um, in verse 11 and 12, if the, if the one believing is a Gentile, uncircumcised. So Abraham, who believed God, and it was credited to his account as righteousness, is to be a father of all others who believe like he did and who are therefore, by their faith, also credited with God's righteousness. And God's promise is that Abraham is, and the offspring like him, his promise to him is that they get the world. This world but not this world as it currently is. Let me take you back to Romans 1 for a moment to see what God thinks of this world as it currently is. Look at verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 20. Creation, what has been made by God, we are told, makes God's attributes clearly seen. So clearly are they seen that man is without excuse. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, they have been clearly seen. What do you mean by that? Well, they're being understood through what has been made so that man is without excuse. Well, no excuse for what? Well, for suppressing the truth of God that is very clear to them that they see, verse 18. And God's response to unrighteous mankind in this world is wrath. Verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And this world right now, as it is, is filled with God-rejecting worshipers. Verse 23, they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God. Verse 25, they exchange the truth of God for a lie and still worshiped and served the creature instead of the creator. You see, this world right now is full of unrighteous sinners. It is full of unrighteousness, and it is under the wrath of God. And God isn't going to give to Abraham that kind of world. This kind of world as it currently is, it doesn't match the righteous status in Abraham's account or any of his believers' account. God isn't going to give this unrighteous, wrath-scarred world as it is to the man credited with God's righteousness by faith. He's not going to give it to his descendants either. In fact, if you live by faith in Jesus Christ right now in this world as it currently stands, you won't feel at all like this world is yours by promise. You'll feel like this world as it currently is has something personal against you. Now, we should anticipate on the basis of this as believers in Jesus Christ, the world that was promised to Abraham and to us. And right now, we're actually told not to love this world nor the things in it, right? Love the promiser. Love the promise. And the world coming in the promise will be pretty amazing with Abraham and all of our other fellow descendants by faith. And of course, the best descendant. Messiah Jesus, the one governing it all. Let me show you just one verse. Go back to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 27. Messiah Jesus had some comments to make about Abraham and the world with him. These are very stern words for those whom Jesus does not know at his second coming. He will say to them, verse 27, I tell you, I don't know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. Depart to me in that pla- from me in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see, not there, But elsewhere, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves being thrown out. Look at this, verse 9 or 29. 
and they will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Messiah will bring from every corner of the world those who must be with their father in faith, Abraham. That is what God promised. And that is what Messiah Jesus guaranteed through his death at the cross. And that is what Messiah Jesus deserves as king. And now I want you to go back all the way. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter 12. I want you to see some of the details of these, this promise that God kept repeating to him. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. I want you to see how world-sized this promise is. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse you. And watch this. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Look at chapter 13, verse 14. And Yahweh said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. You see, the, the world-sized promise is a very Canaan-centered world or a promised land-centered world. That's said again in chapter 15, verse 5. Look at it. He took, Yahweh took Abram outside, and he said, now look toward the heavens. Count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to them, so shall your descendants be. Then Abram believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. Look at verse 18. On that day when Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. It's a very Canaan-centered view of a world-sized promise. Look at chapter 17, verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, Abram, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Look one more, chapter 22, verse 15. Genesis 22, verse 15. Then the angel of Yahweh called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn. So how many people are involved in this promise? Only one. That's important to remember. By myself I have sworn, declares Yahweh, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, Isaac, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And watch this. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now go back to Romans chapter 4. That is a big promise. It is a world-sized, nations-sized, but promised land-focused promise to Abraham and his descendants who will inherit it with him, but not as it currently is. Now, we who believe are called aliens and strangers in this world, scarred by God's wrath and filled with unrighteousness. 
But we will be heirs with Abraham in a world full of righteous believers under the reign of King Messiah. And what a feast, what a banquet that will be. We will recline at the table with Abraham, our father in the faith, and all of his descendants. And that promise, chapter 4, verse 13 of Romans, that promise has nothing to do with law. You see it in chapter 4, verse 13? For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through law. There's no definite article there, the. That means not with any kind of law, including Mosaic law, any moral code of any people anywhere. God did not attach his great big promise to law and the works that law always demands. Abraham did not become the heir of the world and get the promise through the means of the law, but instead he became heir of it all through means of, verse 13, the righteousness of faith. That's just a shorthand description for declared righteousness on the basis of faith alone, credited righteousness through faith alone. So the connection between the world-sized nations, uh, world-sized, nation-sized promise, excuse me, and justification is inseparable. That's what he says. No law keeping will bring about the promise. Now, notice with me, secondly, the invalidation. Let's look at the summary sentence I've given you. Both faith and God's promise are invalidated if his promise is connected to works righteousness or if it's connected to law. You see, Paul explains why the promise is connected to justification and not law or works of law. For if it was hypothetically connected to law for the heirs, verse 14, for if those who are of law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. So if law and works demands, and all the works that law demands gets the promise, then faith is completely shut out. It's void. That means empty. Faith is hollow. Faith has nothing to it. It is rendered useless. Let law step into the spotlight and faith must go into the dark of the trash heap. Law and faith are mutually exclusive for the promise. And we already know they're mutually exclusive for justification as well. If that world-sized, nation-sized promise to Abraham and his descendants is through means of law and the works of the law's demands, faith is void and also the promise is nullified, verse 14. Nullified means the promise is abolished. The promise is worthless. The promise is made of no effect. It is invalidated. So if law and law keeping steps in, faith is done. And the promise is done. Law and promise are completely incompatible. Understand this. Law and the promiser, the one who promised, are completely incompatible for justification, and for the promise. So the promise to Abraham and to his descendants and justification, they're actually very similar because God forbids law to associate with either one of them. Justification is impossible by law, and the promise and faith are both invalidated by law. Why? Look at verse 15. He tells us, for the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. Wherever, whenever God looks at an unrighteous sinner who brings law close to his life and the law keeping close to his life to try to win God's favor, whenever God sees that, it just enrages him with holy wrath. Because we can only sin when we get law up against us, when we pull it near. We're just the wrong kind of people by nature to bring law near and to establish favor with God through law. That's what Romans 1, 2, and most of 3 were all about. And so this is why justification can never be by means of law because it only enrages a holy God with holy wrath. This is why the world-sized, nation-sized promise is also not by means of law because it only enrages him. You remember the, the story in the Old Testament of Haman and Mordecai? Uh, 
when Esther was queen? Remember how he built the gallows to hang Mordecai on? Those gallows, they were Haman's means to the greatness that he wanted for himself. But what happened, you know, right? The very gallows that he put his hope in became the very means used to kill him. And that is what law and law-keeping will be to you if you put your hope in them. Because if you hope bringing law near to you will somehow advance your own self-righteousness favorably before God, the very thing you hope in will turn on you and it will enrage God. It'll slip a rope around your neck and law will become your gallows of death. So what is our hope? Our hope is to find in justification the place where there is no law. If God could only make a place where there is no law in justification, then I won't trespass. I won't transgress. I won't be a violator of that law because there isn't law there on that ground I stand on. In that place, if God creates a place where there is no law for us, in that place we can't sin against law, we can't fail before law because it's not there. And that's exactly Paul's point in verse 15. For the law brings about wrath, but... Is great. Where there is no law, there's no violation. And where there's no law, by God's design and justification, there's no violation. And where there's no violation, most importantly, God is not enraged with holy wrath. This is not a statement that we don't sin until law comes around. Romans 1, 2, and 3 made that pretty clear otherwise, right? So how kind of God, think about this, how kind of God to call us to faith instead of that which would only result in a violation and him being angry with us. He doesn't call you to that. He doesn't call me to that. How kind of God to not put that world-sized, nation-sized promise anywhere near law where we would be doomed and where we would be destroyed, where the promise would also be invalidated. Instead, by his mercy and in his grace, he only put the promise near faith. And that leads us to the next point. Number three, the solidification, verse 16. Because of what he has just said about law and our violation of it and God's response to our violation of it in justification, this is the reason the promise and the inheritance is by faith. For this reason, it's by faith in order that it might be in accordance with grace, that it might operate according to the standard that grace is, also that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants What hope you have if works is connected to the promise and justification? What hope do you have? Everything in your life falls apart. Nothing is secure if your hope is in justification by works. But thank God, the promise is not by law and therefore impossible to receive. And said the promise is by faith so that faith might be operating according to the standard of God's grace, his favor, so that the promise therefore is guaranteed to all of the descendants. You see, guaranteed means it must be solid. It must be unshifting. The promise needs to be stable. And it is so by grace through faith. So here's the summary statement in the parentheses there. God's promise is solidified for all descendants who by grace through faith are justified. It's true. Remember, God is one, chapter three. He only saves one way. So justification by faith alone is consistent. It's predictable and it's sure. You don't have to wake up the next day and wonder if God is now gonna start saving in a different way. No, justification by faith alone in Christ alone is solid. It's going nowhere. It's going nowhere. 
It's what he's set up. And so is the promise in Abraham to all of his descendants. It's solid. It's guaranteed. And it doesn't matter which two categories of humanity those believers come from, whether a Jew or a Gentile. Go back up to chapter 4, verse 11. Do you remember this? Uh, The last part of verse 11. So that Abraham might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. The promise was for those believers, those Gentiles who are uncircumcised. Those Gentiles had Abraham as their father. And in verse 12, he was also the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but those who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So those are the Jews who believe. They also have Abraham as their father. And now Paul does something similar like that down in verse 16. Look down there with me. The descendant for whom the promise is solid because it's by grace through faith alone are either those, verse 16, who are of the law, and that has to mean the Jews who believe, but it's also to those who are the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's those who are outside the Jews who believe. Those are the Gentiles. Now, that, it's a little unusual that when describing the Jewish category of believers, Paul doesn't say more about faith in it, but he only calls them in verse 16, those who are of the law, and the definite article is there, and I think it's a reference to Mosaic law. But the whole sentence clarifies it already because both of those two groups are within the descendants mentioned above and all of those descendants have the promise guaranteed to them by grace through faith so he can say the Jews are the ones who are of the law, meaning they're believers. Paul isn't now at this point becoming inconsistent or contradictory to everything he's been laying out. Listen, if you trust in a set of rules and the good works that those rules demand of you to establish your, to establish favor with God, you are entering into the most unstable life you could ever have. Shifting. But if you will turn away from yourself and trust only in Jesus Christ, not only will your justification be sure, guaranteed, but so will this world-sized, nation's-sized promise, be sure, for you. Now notice lastly with me, number four, the qualification. Verse 17. Upon mentioning that Abraham, at the end of verse 16, he is the father of us all, believing Jews, believing Gentiles. Upon mentioning that, Paul turned to the Old Testament. He turned to Genesis 17.5. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. He turned to that to affirm from the Old Testament the promise that God made to Abraham. When Abraham was uncircumcised, which was 14 years after believing in Genesis 15, verse 6. And again, this is a large promise. You need a world-sized stage to get all of the nations onto it with Abraham. What's the main idea here in this long and somewhat awkward sentence from our perception? It's this the God of the word, because he quotes the word of God. And so he goes to point to the God of the word. He is the only one qualified to guarantee his promise and therefore to guarantee justification. When God met with Abraham again in Genesis 17 and he repeated that world size, nation's size promise, we're told that Abraham was, look at verse 17, he was in the presence of God, the promiser, whom he believed, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God. Abraham, at that moment, was very aware that he was with God when the promise was made. And specifically, some of God's attributes or his characteristics during the repeating of that giant promise, they were on the forefront of his mind as he was believing. These attributes of God helped him to believe. The first attribute of God mentioned helped Abraham when he kept thinking about his own inability. When Abraham kept looking within, there was an attribute of God that helped him to believe. In Genesis 17, Abraham is about 100 years old and Sarah was 90. Physiologically, the ability to have even just one child, 
appears to have set sail a long time ago. How many decades prior? Humanly speaking, this is impossible. Look at chapter 4, verse 19. He contemplated his own body. Now as good as dead. He was about 100 years old, and he contemplated the deadness of his wife's womb. The promise demanded Abraham to father a child. And the second attribute of God mentioned that helped Abraham believe God was when Abraham turned and looked out away from himself. When he turned outward and he looked to the north and he looked to the south and he looked to the east and he looked to the west to where this world-sized, nation-sized descendants would one day be. And there's nothing. There's no one. But when he looked outside himself and he saw nothing, there was yet another attribute of God that helped him to believe. Now, you just need to understand this. Humanly speaking, this promise to Abraham is a cruel joke. Humanly speaking. It is hopeless if it is left in the ability of Abraham. If Abraham is only left there to be aware of himself, there's no way forward. But we are told that Abraham was in the presence of him whom he believed, God. And Abraham is more aware of God at this moment than anyone else. So, concerning how is he going to father a child being as good as dead? Abraham knew God is the one, verse 17, who gives life to the dead. And so God can make life come from what is dead, namely him. And God is the only one qualified to do that. And as Abraham looks to the north and to the south and the east and the west, and he sees not even one descendant, he's more aware of God's presence, God's character than anything else as he believes God. This is the God who calls into being, verse 17, that which does not exist. You know Genesis 1, God spoke the word light. And in so doing, God just authoritatively summoned into being that which was not there before. And therefore, God is qualified from Abraham's perspective to summon into existence not just one baby and not just one physical nation of descendants, but a whole seed of believers from all of the nations. That God can speak and summon it into existence. He's in the presence of that God, he believed. Where nations of believing descendants didn't yet exist, they do now. By God's authoritative call. There's only one person qualified to pull this whole thing off, and it's, it's God. So, Back to the reason and why is promise everywhere in the middle of this? Why connect the promise and justification together like this? Why not just say you're not justified by law? Why make the point over and over that law doesn't bring the promise about? Doesn't, isn't the answer at least doesn't at least have to do with how impossible, how impossible the promise was apart from God. How impossible the promise was if it depended on Abraham. Isn't that an amazing illustration to put alongside justification? You see a a good as dead old man with a wife with a dead womb. If it depends on them to have one baby, it's impossible. And if it depends on them to make a nation out of the impossible baby, 
to come forth from there. That's even more impossible. Let alone if it depends on them to make nations of believers in Yahweh, in Jesus. It's absolutely, completely, entirely, without a doubt, impossible. Because all of that is way beyond their own resources. And so what a powerful way to illustrate how utterly impossible and ridiculous it is for, our, for unrighteous men and women to try to achieve justification through law with their own resources. Law is useless for justification because of our condition. We're just the wrong kind of people for law to work in justification. And Abraham and Sarah were just the wrong kind of people to try to have a baby, let alone have a nation through that impossible baby, let alone get nations of believers through that impossible baby, which is an impossible nation. It's impossible. Surely this is at least part of why justification is linked to God's promise so closely. And so what about you? you? You need to grasp this about salvation if you haven't. What you must grasp about being saved is your own spiritual deadness first and your own spiritual nothingness. You have as good a chance of establishing your own righteous through law keeping that God will accept as Abraham had in producing nations as his descendants on his own. Instead, you need to do like Abraham. And you need to turn away from yourself to God and trust that out of your spiritual deadness and out of your spiritual nothingness, he can do what he says he does in salvation, which is you trust me, I give you my righteous status. Your deadness can't produce it. Your nothingness can get you there. You must look away from yourself, cast yourself by faith on that one, that God. Believe him and believe his son Jesus. And he will call into being a relationship with him that currently does not exist for you. plead with you this morning, if you haven't, turn away from yourself and turn to Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Trust in his death in your place at the cross to satisfy God's wrath against you and to pay the penalty to set you free from your slavery to sin. Upon doing so, God will put into your status account his very own righteousness through faith alone. And in your deadness and in your nothingness, you'll all of a sudden have everything you need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving life to the dead. And thank you for having such power that you can summon into existence the things that do not exist. It's true in creation. It is certainly true in our salvation. And it's true in this promise that is ours. Thank you. Lord, first... Would you today, just for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, would you wean us just a little bit more today off of this world as it is? Whatever appetites we have for the things of this world, would you, would you make, make us sick to our stomach over them? Would you dampen our affections and abolish them for the things that are in the world?
And may we still trust in a promise that is coming that we have not yet seen. That with Abraham, a world full of nations of believers, with your precious son reigning supremely, wean us off of this world and grow our affections for the next coming when he comes. And Father, be powerful in the life of one who has not yet trusted in you. Show them the ridiculousness, the, the foolishness of still trusting in their own resources, Lord. Draw them to yourself now by faith. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.